Good evening and welcome to tonight's event as part of the University's Festival of Ideas. Uh, my name is Roger Shannon and I'm the director of one of the University's research institutes, ICE, for sure, Institute for Creative Enterprise. And uh, the screen tonight and the discussion is part of ICE's bit in the Festival of Ideas. And the overall theme is identity and when I um, spotted uh, the new film by Raoul Peck, uh, I Am Not Your Negro, and saw the reviews of it, I thought that's uh, exactly the kinds of kind of film, the kind of discussion that I think would be really relevant to have at the university. And I was very pleased that June Giovanni, on my right, agreed to come and introduce the film and discuss it afterwards. I'm just going to give a very brief um, intro to June, and then June will um, introduce the film. Uh, for over 30 years, uh, June has been a remarkable curator of African and African diaspora cinema, starting out working on the Third Eye Film Festival in London. She then went on to programme nationally and internationally, eventually setting up the African Caribbean unit of the British Film Institute in 1992. And then from 1993 to 96, she published the BFI's Black Film Bulletin annually with Galen Gould. Throughout her career, June has been programming at prominent film festivals around the world, and on this journey has built up a wealth of material of and about Pan-African cinema, which dates from the 1970s. This includes films, photographs, audio interviews, journals, posters, scripts, and memorabilia, all devoted to the celebration of black experience on film. As June herself says, Historic moments in the development of Caribbean, Black British, African American and African cinema played witness to significant movements that transcend geographical boundaries and played, uh, sorry, have given rise to a global dialogue. And I think the movie I'm Not Your Negro fits into some of those descriptions. But enough about me talking, it's June Giovanni here to introduce the film. Thank you, June. Thank you, Roger, and good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be here um, and to find friends that um, uh, perhaps I didn't know, but at least we have mutual friends and there are a couple of faces that I recognize. So I'm glad to be here. I, I don't often get to Liverpool, but um, uh, any opportunity and I'll, I'll come. I know this is sort of just outside, but I'm very glad to be here and I hope that we'll have a good evening. I do know Raoul very well. We've worked together over very many years from the beginning of his career in film, in fact, when he made his first film, um, uh, Haitian Corner, because I used to work with a film festival in Martinique called Dimash Kari, where the film won, where Raoul won his first uh, accolade and it was for that film. Anyway, let me, um, of course, I'm not going to talk about the film because I need you to see and experience it, how, you, how it's presented. Uh, what I will talk a bit about, though, is the artistic collaboration, uh, especially uh, in terms of what Raoul Peck, who he is and what he brought to this, how this, this artistic collaboration came about. But first of all, history is such a funny thing. And in this case, a number of conditions, occasions and events and anniversaries have come together to make this moment and this film, this moment, 2017, and this film, one that grabs our attention. 2017 sees the 30 year anniversary of James Baldwin's death. And this film, which was 10 years in the making, <coughs> lies on our screens at a time when each of us need to hear and see and be reminded of our responsibilities in this world more than ever and the true meaning of humanity. 2017 is also the year in which four out of five Oscar-nominated documentaries, including I'm Not Your Negro, were made by African diaspora directors. And 2017, as this film was opening across the UK, uh, a number of people in the black community and beyond were mourning the death 
of one of the UK's significant civil rights leaders, Darkus Ham, and to whom we owe a great debt of gratitude for standing firm in England. So, a bit about Raoul, because it's important to understand something about the filmmaker, because this film is very much an artistic collaboration between Raoul and po uh, posthumously James Baldwin. Most people here will have heard or have read Baldwin or seen films about him, maybe in The Price of the Ticket, the, the biographical film. But many people might not know much about Raoul Peck, so I want to talk first a little bit about him so that you'll be able to grasp something of the background of this unique and this imaginative collaboration. So who is, is he? He's Haitian, and he lives between Haiti, USA, and France. You can't think of Raoul and his work without evoking the historical identity of Haiti itself as the first black republic and its founders, Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who had the audacity to take control of their own destiny at a time when the Western world saw African peoples as inhuman objects of trade, an audacity for which the French have never forgiven Haiti. Fast forward two centuries or so, and we find examples of that audacity of one of the young leaders on the African continent who believe in self-determination, independence, and taking control of their own destinies. One of the most brutal and flagrant attacks by the previous colonial power, Belgium, and other Western allies was on Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. There have, of course, been others since. The subject of a feature film and a documentary by Raoul. Raoul Peck has always taken his identity and his responsibility seriously as a Haitian and as a Pan-African citizen of the world. This characteristic demonstrated, is demonstrated in his relentless endeavor to bring films to the screen that provide the missing histories, the missing perspectives, the missing stories of our time and times past, and linking them in such a way that we can better understand the nature of humanity, of politics, and of power. These historical moments, I think, help us to understand why this son of the Haitian soil and the citizen of the world should turn his considerable, considerable cinematic skills to examining and showing us the meaning of power on the world stage, in the national arenas, and in relationships between people. If there is one thematic thread in Raoul's work, it is this one, most acutely brought to the screen in both of his films, um, on Lumumba, uh, the Congo, on Man by the Shore, that was presented at Cannes, Haiti, and in Sometimes in April, that was made in Rwanda about the genocide there and actually um, uh, presenting uh, the story indicating as well the implication that the world or the United Nations and all of the main, main characters had to play in that story. And also in his uh, documentary before I'm Not Your Negro, a documentary called Assistance, Assistance deadly assistance, where the axis of world powers are directly implicated. The French journalist uh, in Le Monde, um, Marie-Thérèse de Fontaine, uh, says of Raoul in his films, by working on this perpetual movement between yesterday and today, Raoul Peck reveals a tight connection between the political and the intimate. This is one of the major currents in his films. So, a little bit more. What are his inspirations and his passions? It's clear that the politics and the sense of justice has inspired many things that Raoul's done in his life, including when he served his country, Haiti, as Minister of Culture during a difficult time of transition and right in the middle of his, his film career. Raoul is described as an eternal exile by Bernard Tavernier, the distinguished French director of the film Round Midnight and others. Whether that is true or not, he is a man with a double mission, one for humanity and one for cinema. The UCLA filmmakers of the LA Rebellion, 1970s and 80s, whose work Raoul admires 
and has encouraged his own artistry and strident voice. The work of the masters of African cinema and the world movement of third cinema, prevalent in the Cold War years of the 1980s in Cuba and Latin America, generally were some of the areas that he engaged with and looked for role models in his craft. He says, undisputable inspirations from my own third world identity as a filmmaker are filmmakers and friends like Charles Burnett, Heidi Garima, Usman Simben, among many others, who showed the way before anybody else and definitely helped to develop genuine portrayals of ourselves on the screen, but also places, locations, people, television, American cinema as a whole. And much of French cinema played a major part in building a new, building a view and a style. It's all part of my heritage. And in his formative years, training in Germany, Raoul worked with Christoph Kieslowski. So we shouldn't be surprised about the rigor and the intensity of his shots and scenes, even in his documentaries. By the time Raoul made his most highly acclaimed feature, The Man by the Shore, he was being hailed as one of the mavericks of world cinema in Cannes at the Kenzen de Realizator, at the Toronto International Film Festival with Lumumba, uh, he gave uh, Maverick talks, and most recently, also at the Kerala International Film Festival, he gave the G.R. Rabindan lecture. So he's seen throughout the industry very much as a Maverick. Um, I could, I think I'd better stop there. What I can speak a bit more about, uh, maybe later, is um, how the collaboration came about in the sense of what it was that um, Baldwin's sister and, um, and uh, lawyer uh, saw in Raoul and his work, and how that actually led to the, the collaboration that, that you will see um, uh, resulted in this film. So um, I'll leave it there for now, and we can uh, pick it up again afterwards. So thank you. Enjoy. So just before the film, um, June, June had just mentioned um, the Baldwin estate. So I just wanted to pick up on that first because the, uh, the Baldwin estates are apparently notoriously difficult to deal with. Um, and I had some experience of this myself many, many years ago with Giovanni's Room, um, which was one of, is one of his novels and I was involved with an adaptation of it, which never got made. Um, but um, this is the form of this documentary. In some ways, it's, you might think it's like a feature film because it's written by James Baldwin. So as a documentary, all, all the words in, in the film spoken are by James Baldwin. It's, a sort, it's a quite a unique project. And I'm sure that may have raised some problems for the Baldwin estate at the beginning for, for the director. Well, um, what, what I had wanted to talk a bit about also is about Raoul and why they saw him as, uh, you know, ideal for this. Because people like Spike Lee and many other directors had been to the estate to ask for um, permission to use Baldwin's work. And it was true that with someone like Baldwin, who was passionate about justice, about humanity. It was always going to be a really important and significant decision that the filmmaker or the, the artist and <coughs> writer or the activist who would bring his work to the screen and to the widest public would have to be someone with deep understanding of Baldwin's legacy and who shared his passions and his purpose, but who could also demonstrate in his own mastery uh, on the craft of film, that he can translate that legacy to the screen. So what is it about the pairing of this particular writer and this director that was so perfect that it has produced this memorable film um, that will move and has been moving people to deep reflection and an even deeper understanding of many of the issues facing us then in Baldwin's time and now Peck had a passion for what Baldwin had to say. 
Baldwin's writing helped Peck, uh, Peck's own understanding of the world and of politics. Baldwin was the most influential writer for Peck in his teenage and his formative years. And Peck says, Baldwin gave him the lexicon by which to understand his life and the world around him. He says, I came to, to cinema by politics. For me, the question is how to live in society, how to fight to change things. Cinema is one of the answers. I chose it for its effectiveness, for the position it occupies in our societies. With this medium, you can penetrate deeply into the minds and hearts of people. So the most important film to see to understand the family's choice of Raoul Peck is the film he made, Raoul made, about his family's experience of one of the historical, historic periods of political injustice <coughs> and the colonial manipulation of the emblematic figure Patrice Lumumba. And just a little segue into this. Lumumba's Pan-African vision was to encourage um, black people, black um, uh, professionals to, who are trained from around the world to come <coughs> back to the Congo and to take the place of the colonizers as they left. Raoul's parents responded to that call and moved to the Congo. So his family were there during Patrice Lumumba's time. And this is what links back with the, what I said earlier about audacity from Haiti you've got Lumumba who was re regarded as this audacious young leader that he could uh, dismiss the, co the colonizers and build an African state, his audacity at that time. So Raoul's documentary, um, Lumumba, Death of a Prophet, is the one that the family had seen. They'd seen <coughs> the feature film Lumumba as well, but Lumumba, Death of a Prophet, is his documentary with, where he combines the personal and the political in a really poetic presentation with not only official archive, but with their own family archive of that place and that time. Raoul was about eight or 10, I think, during the time that they lived in. in the, so if you haven't seen this film, I would suggest it's one to add, you know, to, to show here. And it's the film that, that um, it's the film that uh, Baldwin's sister and lawyer saw and which convinced them of his skill and his qualities of, uh, as a filmmaker to take on the task. Um, other, well, as we've said, other well-known um, filmmakers had approached. And so he asked, Raoul asked for access to everything. So the, the, the lot of the text here is not just um, Baldwin's published work, or him, him seeing, or um, uh, recorded, uh, uh, or recordings of Baldwin speaking. It's also notes, papers, his personal notes. And um, in fact, some way into the process, and Raoul says at the beginning he wasn't sure that he was actually going to make either a documentary or a, a, a feature film, a, a dramatic uh, narrative. Um, he, but he had to look through all of this work and they gave him everything. And it was some way into that exploration and he did actually write um, a, uh, a narrative film at one point, a narrative script at one point. But it was somewhere into his exploration of Baldwin um, and the work, the actual text, that he decided that it should be a documentary. And they allowed him four years to explore all of that material. And he says um, that when he, was, he began to work on this idea or to form, formulate the idea, um, Gloria Carif Smart, Baldwin's younger sister, sent uh, Raoul the unpublished notes of a manuscript for a book Baldwin had been writing called Remember This House. And that is the structure that he's used. And when Raoul saw that, he knew that that was going to be the structure for the film. 
and that it became the framework. He was convinced that um, Baldwin had in fact written the elements of this book in his life's work and that his job, Peck's job, was to go through Baldwin's body of work and find the book that Baldwin didn't have time to do, which also is quite audacious in a way, but, with, but it came from a deep place and a deep understanding. Um, also, they would have remarked as well that there were similarities between the two men. They were both writers. They were both driven by a keen sense of justice and impassioned uh, by making it their life work to speak out against injustice with their respective skills. So they both believe be deeply in humanity and power that people have to change the world. They were both more than, than uh, witnesses. They were actors, as Baldwin says in the film, something that Baldwin encourages us all to be. Um, there's other stuff I can say, but I think we need... No, I think the... Opportunity. Um, I think the, the structure of um, the three friends who had died and the, the telling that the story of the civil rights era through Medgar Evans, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King um, is a fascinating structure to work with. Um, what I also um, were, uh, admired in the film was um, the way that it used, obviously the way it uses archive, particularly the way that it brings it to the present with, you know, there's a phrase at the end, history is in the present. And so very recent documentary footage of incidents in America, um, the developments of Black Lives Matter, et cetera, um, show the continuation of the story that, in a sense, the documentary is historically set in the civil rights era, but it makes the presence so resonant by bringing that material in. But the other, the other force of the archive for me was how much of a public intellectual that James Baldwin was in that period. I mean, from the Dick Cavett show to the debates at Cambridge University, which was obviously recorded and then, then used in, in some way. And the fact that um, he, uh, he had that, that role in that position in discussions of black culture and black life in that period. Um, so for me, it's... it's um, it's the use, it, for me, politically, it's the way that the, the archive is used to kind of make those, those points. Yeah, I think the film actually, you know, it cries out for uh, a thesis on narrative in, uh, in film, narrative in cinema. And because it's spread, I mean, Raoul has done uh, dramatic features, narrative features, and documentaries, but his documentaries always have a really interesting and powerfully emotional arc. So it's, I mean, there's so much to explore in narrative through his work because it, it's, it's so important how he creates, um, uh, effectively tells the story, but also tells it with the emotion, which is usually reserved for, for um, dramatic narratives. And he does it very e effectively. But so juxtapositions and, but there's also a great performance in, in the narration by Samuel L. Jackson because it, it comes over as a, as a real performance rather than just speaking the, the lines that he has to do. It, it, very, it works with everything else. Um, now, I, I just want to throw it open for um, the audience because we've got 15 minutes or so in here before we can um, move back to the reception we were having before but, um, and continue talking there. But can you indicate if you have a question and then we'll get the microphone to you? This, this gentleman. Oh, yeah, he at the front. And then uh, who's after him? Oh, one at the back. Okay, we'll take you, this one first and then we'll go up the, the back, yeah. I just wanted to you know the, uh, the views in the mainstream British and American um, literary quarter. Sorry? What? I wanted the reviews of this film. How, in, in, how will they... How yeah, will they system, in the mainstream British and American literary quarters. Literary quarters. Well, the, what, th what the, the reviews that, that I've read, I mean, I mean, because the film had a, had a release uh, a couple of months ago in the, U, in the UK. Um, I think all the reviews that I saw were, were, were you know, four or five stars. Um, the, but those are the film reviews. 
Um, I didn't see any reviews that were, in a sense, by literary writers. Is that if that's are you try, are you digging into that area rather than the film reviews? Yes, yeah, it, it isn't very art itself. I would have thought it uh, not only is it political content, but mm -hmm. it just seems that sort of literary uh, roses, project kind of thing. We have a layman review, but this is all that happens. It is very well said, and I'm so nice of you to give us a good background. But he finishes here. I don't think I've read anything of this in Guardian or Observe anywhere. What the film? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's, yes. there's. Um, I and, mean, and in America as well. I mean, it was it was Oscar nominated, so I mean, it so it, it had, had a lot of a lot. coverage for that reason. Um, and um, the, um, I mean, the film played in Liverpool. It's pl already played in Liverpool um, um, on its on its release. I, I mean, wh what I thought you were getting at was uh, um, rather than the film reviews, whether there was um, a pickup in terms of you know. It, Literary views about James Baldwin's writings and yeah, there was quite a lot. I thought there was quite a lot in the the, the broadsheets um, a couple of months ago. But let's pick up on the second. There's a question up there, and then who's next? So I'm lining them up. One here. I'm back here. You start then. Okay. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really a question. It was a comment about the film. Um, and it was about the address of the film. The, the film strikes me as addressing white people. Um, the title of the film addresses white people. And it's asking, although it's structured around the deaths of three famous black people, it's asking white people to take responsibility for race and for the naming that he talks about right at the end of that film. Um, and I think the way in which I had seen that film talked about was not about that direct address. It was about a his, you know, civil rights and so on, and m making a connection between the violence towards black people, and, which of course it is about. But the Samuel Jackson's na narrative voice is a narrative voice addressed directly at white people. And I've seen him do this before in the film, uh, in a documentary, The N-Word, where he, he, he does that very directly. Uh, and it's very clear that Peck want to address this film towards a white audience, which, uh, unlike Malcolm X, who was mainly addressing a black audience, for example. Uh, and I thought the ch choice of... Um, Samuel L. Jackson was an interesting one, not, not one that you perhaps um, think of when, when you read Baldwin's novels, you know, um, a, a certain kind of black masculinity that differs from, from Baldwin. Um, and uh, as, a, as one of the kind of key choices that Peck makes, it seems to me that that is an important one. So it, it was just it was just a comment, but uh, you know we're in a room which is fairly dominated by white people, and, and that's a film that's addressing white people. It's not about black people in that object way that um, we often, so often see. It's also about American race. I think in a very strong way he talks about that being a story of America um, rather than being. I mean, obviously, it's a global issue too, but um, I, I think it's I think it's both, and I think in a, at a number of uh, points during the film, it's addressing us all. It's saying that we all have this responsibility. I mean, he does it sometimes when he was talking about um, some of the dramatic uh, films and sequences that he chose. He mentioned that you know this this responsibility on both sides. And I think Baldwin's statement at director camera at, at the end also indicates that we are talking about both. Of course, white people do have a, a particular role in this, but I think the stress is because it's usually, black people are usually seen as the problem. And he is stating, we are all the problem and we all have a res not we're all the problem, but we all have a responsibility in making this, in taking this out, taking this 
um, and creating the world in which we live in. I should say something as well about the title, um, I'm Not Your Negro. I mean, we come back to this idea of audacity because when uh, Raoul was asked about the title, why did he choose that title? And he said that um, he needed to choose a title that was a sort of a direct call that Baldwin, Baldwin is effecting through his work. And don't forget, this, the, na the narrative here, the words here, are based not only on Baldwin's novels, but on his notes and his other writing, and on this particular notes for this particular book. And you could see from what, he, what was written, he was very moved and very angry by, about those three deaths. So that, would have, that would, is what is also coming through there. And um, um, <coughs> Peck says that it, this was a sort of, this I am not your Negro is a sort of a direct call that Baldwin is effecting through his work. It's the direct call that says, this is who I am. This is where I stand. Deal with it. It's not aggressive. It's just something that he could say about who he is. And Peck says he had to choose a title that would dare, that would be audacious, no less than Baldwin, Baldwin himself would be. So it had to be something that he could say and would be powerful. So I see how you might think it is only addressing, or it's predominantly addressing white people, but that's because very often when race is discussed, it isn't often addressing, but he's putting white people very much in the frame because sometimes that part gets missed out in, in my reading of it. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, the explanation, and the opportunity to see it on a big screen. I, I saw it on an on a aeroplane about two years ago and it wasn't as good. Um, it was good, but it wasn't as good. I, I just wanted to make a comment that I've just come from the Sydney Film Festival where this screened and I also saw um, Warwick Thornton's We Don't Need a Map, which is um, an Indigenous Australian um, film about really reminding white Australians about their history. And, uh, and, and it's, it's a very irreverent, audacious film in its own way. And I just thought what was so interesting is the way um, Baldwin is looking back at the, um, the genocide of Indigenous people in America and what um, Thornton does is look at that in the context of Australia but he also looks forward to um, the present day in Australia and the way in which black Muslims particularly and, and Muslims of colour and Muslims not of colour in Australia generally are, are being um, vilified and attacked. So um, I think the two films are really interesting. They're both another 2017 thing. They're both coming out together and they're both talking to the continuance of history and the continuance of white crime um, in relation to our fellow citizens, but particularly in colonial situations, which of course brings us right back to this country, which started a lot of that. So I just wondered if you talk a little bit more about this kind of historical sweep of both Baldwin, but maybe the way in Pe which Peck has dealt with it. Well, it's, but the thing is, the strength comes from Baldwin's philosophy. I mean, the fact that all that he was saying in 1950s, and you could find pertinent, you know, even through just this year, even if you were to just take 2017, all of those killings in America by police, the fight within the, those communities, and all that's been happening here, up to the last couple of weeks. I you know, don't want to use things like the, the Grenfell fire and so in all of these things. It's, it's because it has a philosophical base that's really quite sound. His analysis in the 50s of what was happening, what was the relationship, and especially the, the, um, the um, Cambridge lecture. You can actually watch it. I think it might even be on YouTube the whole thing, yeah? You can watch the whole thing on YouTube and it is very eloquent. And the thing is, the philosophy is so sound that whenever you address <coughs> the topic 
and especially it's about justice and it's about the relationships between people in that basis. You will, you can use it as, as something that will give you an understanding. It will give you an understanding of what is happening. You could actually, when the Grenfell fire thing happened, you know, you could, you could actually find Baldwin's uh, narrative in that situation. You can actually find it to explain a lot of what's, what is happening today. And it's because it is a strong philosophical basis, a strong analysis of those relationships and an indication, indication of so you know, how things may have changed, but how they seem to have changed, but how they remain the same. And that is why when he mentions about, you know, castration in the north or the south, it's the same thing. It might not be physical castration, but it's castration in terms of where people are in the society and how they are treated. And that is why the narrative and the, the words and the ideas that he use, uses transcends time and moments. And I suspect it's the same with the, with the um, Australian film, although I haven't seen it. But it's that strength of the philosophy that makes it timeless. And obviously, Raoul's skill in identifying knowing the work so well and being able to identify the current narratives that would intersect with that. Sorry. Just, yeah, and we'll, we'll have to make this the last question before we wrap up, yeah. It's a quarter past already. Yeah. I just want to ask, is, uh, would you say that um, audacity is a general idea like political strategy or like, is it just going to be used in other context back when obviously the racial context that with the film has been obviously focused on tonight. That's just a you know, bad example, but it's a, can we say that punk music is a working class audacity? Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense, something like that. And I'll leave it there and let you answer the question. <laughs> Whether audacity is a political strategy or... Um, well, with punk music, it could make a lot of sense, yeah, it is. As you were saying. Yeah. It means you, you dare to challenge convention. I mean, artists tend to be pretty audacious because they are challenging conventions and you know that is whether it's music musicians or visual artists writers whatever people yeah well i think with in in this film you've got two audacious artists in a dialogue with each other the filmmaker and uh the writer and uh, and uh, i i i only know some of Raoul peck's films i don't know uh, all of them in the way that um, June does. But I know formally he's an audacious, the films I've seen, he's an audacious um, filmmaker, probably driven by the idea that to, um, to, to make something new, which is making new political statements, you're, you are audaciously working with the form and with the content. And I think as a, as a, as a writer, that's what Baldwin did as well. And obviously, coming back to punk, that's what punk did. Um, I'm going to um, call this in here to a halt because we have to finish about 8.15 in here. Uh, but we have a reception for everybody which is in the Arts Centre, main part which is left out of the cinema, follow the corridor round and then you can have a drink, have a chat. June will, will be there, we can have a more informal kind of uh, discourse about the film. Um, so please join us there. Uh, pleased to see so many um, out on what is rather hot and balmy evenings at the moment um, for such a memorable film. And I'd like to obviously thank June for coming up, um, giving us her thoughts about Baldwin, Ral Peck uh, and the exchange that they've done in this film. Thank you, June. Thank you.